Thanks. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, that by Mark was just actually a bit of an inside joke. The, uh, Mark also needs no introduction. The, um, uh, so, so Dan showed this slide earlier about um, uh, our, our um, uh, pathway and um, a slide that he has shown and I have shown a lot. And you know, one of our um, uh, perspectives on this and how we make this a reality is, is of course, the f foundations of biomedical research and, and commitments to information technology and um, this iterative process of using the healthcare system, the electronic health record, all the data we passively collect as you know, a tool to engineer and adapt the system over time. And so because of this, and, and many of you I know are familiar with a lot of the work that Vanderbilt has done, um, I just want to set up as a foundation that you know, we use the electronic health record to both feed uh, research and implementation. And um, a lot of the uh, work that we've done uh, to implement actually involved, you know, using our data to show that, you know, these um, uh, experiences actually matter for our patients. And it's led some of the iterations. So on the discovery side, we have BioView, which is de-identified. That's not used for clinical care. I just want to set that up. Um, and implementation side, where I'm going to spend most of this time talking about is PREDICT program, which led to our IGNITE project. Um, we did not um, imbibe as much alcohol before as Indiana and did not come up with this, you know, as creative a name as ingenious. Um, and, um, and, and that's also led to some implementation activities around eMERGE as well. And that's all in the CLIA environment, uh, data in the electronic medical record. And um, as others have done, it's been part of a, uh, primarily as a quality improvement initiative as opposed to a research initiative. And then we look at what happens. Um, on the discovery side, uh, BioView is formed from a de-identified resource of all the electronic health record data and other tools we bring in there. Um, and that's about two, uh, 235,000 individuals that we do research on. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of that has been on uh, disease associations, but it's been a good tool for research into pharmacogenetic effects. Um, one of the first we did as we were designing and launching PREDICT was replicating this well-known association with clopidogrel, and um, we've talked a lot about it. So I'll just show you, you know, the clinical trial data versus, you know, our data, and you see a, essentially the same effect size. Um, and um, honestly, that was really important for our physicians um, uh, because they were saying at the time, I didn't necessarily, uh, you know, I don't necessarily believe the research data. I want to see it in, you know, kind of real world data when they take 15 other medicines, whether it matters. And so, you know, we were showing, well, you know, this is what happens. Now, that was maybe a different era. That was uh, 2010. Um, but, you know, it was an important aspect of it. And so we've done a lot of other discovery efforts here. It has not yet led to, interestingly, a new discovery uh, of a new pharmacogenetic effect that we have turned around and implemented, but it has led to, um, uh, for instance, a few revisions of some things we did. For instance, uh, we first moved from um, alerting providers for both poor metabolizers and intermediate metabolizers, really based largely on the results that we had uh, for clopidogrel. So, Talking about PREDICT and our implementation program, that's uh, from our first flyer that we handed to patients. Um, uh, one of the things we decided to do first was define, you know, kind of who is at high risk if we were to um, uh, implement a preemptive program, which was our desire. So we looked at 53,000 patients who have routine care at Vanderbilt, and we asked how many received um, at one of, uh, at the time, 57 medications with an FDA story um, for a uh, pharmacogenetic-based um, uh, prescribing. And um, we found that over um, five years, um, 57, I'm sorry, 65 percent of those patients um, would have received at least one of those medications. Um, you can see some of those individuals received quite a few, you know, with a significant number of people receiving 10 um, or more medications that had potential pharmacogenetic indications. And if you turn, if you look at um, just um, six uh, drug adverse events that have high morbidity, morbidity or mortality, that equates to um, about 383 events um, uh, over five years for those 53,000 people, or about 12 to 18 uh, events for an average PCP. So this was one of those things we said, okay, this, this gives us some evidence um, to suggest that we can 
uh, th that these events will be relatively common. Interestingly, um, uh, it's skewed towards some of the, the more frequent medicines ended up being skewed to some of the more frequent um, uh, medications with more serious adverse events like clopidogrel. Uh, we did some surveys of providers. This was early on in the implementation of our program, um, but it was actually after it had been implemented. Um, these are 121 people who had seen um, uh, a uh, patient with pharmacogenetic test results in their chart at some point, um, uh, not with any direct uh, 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 education efforts or anything outreach from um, the program. And uh, you can see by the top bar there that, you know, the vast majority of the physicians interestingly believed that genetic profiles um, would influence uh, a person's response to drug therapy, um, that um, the, most of them believed uh, specifically for clopidogrel and, um, and also warfarin that these uh, would make a difference. And the factors influencing whether or not they would consider ordering a uh, pharmacogenetic test um, was driven uh, most strongly by their belief in the evidence um, of efficacy, um, which we found very reassuring. Um, the fact that it was an institutional priority, um, uh, for instance, um, is uh, ranked towards the bottom of this list. Um, uh, being prompted by an alert in the EHR itself um, was uh, actually at the bottom of the list. But the interesting thing is people don't remember to order it without an, a, a, being prompted by an alert. So, so they won't order it because of it, but, uh, but, but they will not order it without it. Um, so when we set up PREDICT, one of the other things uh, we did is we set up a review process. Um, it starts with evidence-based um, uh, review, and, um, and, and Guidance for Professional Society, CPIC, was not um, really in existence when we started this. Um, and so now a lot of that has been supplanted by CPIC guidelines and we are able to follow those and we um, do follow those and are involved in um, some of those now. The, um, and then um, the replication component that I mentioned before. Some of the replication was actually needed to give um, real world models to what we were going to provide suggestions for, for instance with warfarin. And then we have a um, special division of our pharmacy and therapeutics committee that would review these and then present these to the rest of the PNT committee. Um, before being implemented. This is um, what uh, our uh, intervention looks like um, when you open up a patient's chart. Uh, we have a homegrown EHR currently for another uh, six months, um, and uh, then we'll be moving to EPIC. Um, in this face page of our uh, patient summary, we put the drug gene interactions between the allergies and adverse drug reactions and medication section. Um, we don't necessarily expect people to, um, to look at these and act on and remember to um, look at these drug genome interactions when they prescribe, but it gets people used to seeing these kinds of results, and that's one of the reasons we put it up here. It also shows you what we had implemented um, or do have implemented, clopidogrel, simvastatin, thiopurines, uh, tacrolimus um, on there, and I feel like we're I'm missing, did I say warfarin? Warfarin. It's five of those. Um, uh, in addition to that, um, we, of course, have uh, clinical decision support um, on both our inpatient and outpatient environments for all of these, and that was really something we considered a requirement before we released them into the patient's chart. Those five interventions were released over the period of a couple different years as the evidence was um, developed and the decision support was developed. In certain cases, we had to enhance the underlying EHR to support uh, for instance, the calculations needed to calculate warfarin dose. Um, and so it took a couple years to actually get that into the system. Uh, this is what it looks like for clopidogrel. Uh, you're able to change your prescription with a single click. Dan showed this result before. Um, this looks at the first about 10,000 patients that we had tested and how many had actionable results. So Todd talked about um, uh, about 25% of um, their um, patients would have an actionable result for a given um, a DGI. And, and Chris, I think you echoed similar numbers from the 1,200 patients um, project. You know, this um, cumulative result of 91% um, would be, um, you know, if, if you encountered that drug, essentially if you encountered all five of those drug genome interactions uh, or sort of drugs in a patient who was genotyped, you would do something different um, than, you know, normal for 91% um, of them. And if you look at each individual drug, um, with the exception of the thyropurine example, you know, each drug um, does have about a quarter of the patients who have an actionable variant on e either an intermediate 
or a poor metabolizer status, um, uh, or it could be ultra rapid depending on your drug. Since we multiplex this testing, um, uh, it gave us, and a lot of these tested um, individuals were tested preemptively, it gave us the ability to look at um, our ability to reuse the data over time. And uh, as I said, you know, we rolled out these five interventions over the period of a couple different years. And so the um, original people were just tested for clopidogrel. And that was the only live test for um, probably the first year or so. And so uh, the first 4,700 people um, that were tested uh, were tested, uh, had an immediate indication for one drug. And about 53% of those individuals um, at that point were essentially tested preemptively. And then as we un unveiled more drug genome interactions and patients accrued more drug exposures over time, um, four years into the project, we had used the data, um, you know, over 14,000 times on the 9,600 people we had tested, although, you know, about 6,000 of those people that were tested initially had no indication for being tested. So, so not, you know, not everyone who was tested did we use their data, but in, in certainly some individuals we use the data multiple times. Um, and so there, there's a cost savings here, um, even in a small number of drugs to test, you know, uh, multiple potential indications up front in this analogy. When you look at what providers do, um, this looks at uh, whether our providers followed a recommendation for clopidogrel. Um, and again, you know, all these individuals will see decision support. Some of, uh, a number of these individuals are tested prospectively. Some are tested as they walked into the cath lab. So the test results would come back after um, they uh, potentially received their stent um, and uh, had already been prescribed clopidogrel. But uh, you can see that providers responded in really a dose-dependent fashion um, uh, based on the severity of the variants. So those that were poor metabolizers for CYP2C19, um, about 58% of them eventually got switched to alternative therapy. Uh, if you remove the contraindications for uh, Prasagril, which was the primary uh, drug during most of this time, um, uh, about 70% of the people were switched uh, that were poor metabolizers. And then, you know, about half that number uh, with, uh, that were intermediate metabolizers, 33% uh, um, were switched uh, to alternative therapies. And of course, the alternative therapies also cost more. You have to recontact individuals in some cases to switch um, as well. Um, but you can see providers are sort of making a real calculation on whether or not they want to switch individuals um, based on a number of factors, um, some of which is, of course, I think, perceived risk of the adverse event. The, um, uh, uh, as uh, newer drugs have come out, you know, certainly there's a prevalent argument that the newer drugs are better. Um, we should just start, switch to using those. Um, and, you know, clopidogrel maybe is being replaced. So um, we are, um, as Ignite, looking at a network, um, uh, whether or not uh, we're seeing this kind of effect and what are the opportunities to um, tailor therapy based on genetics um, are. Um, and so um, these are some initial results um, looking at, uh, in this case, antiplatelets. So you can see clopidogrel is still the predominant medication used um, at, at three of uh, our IGNITE sites, um, uh, Vanderbilt, the VA, and uh, Aurora um, still continue to use clopidogrel predominantly um, over prasugrel and ticagrelor. Um, the same thing is seen for warfarin. Um, you can see um, a, a more dramatic, uh, there is an increased uh, prescription of the alternative agents in the case of warfarin, especially at the VA. Um, and uh, uh, the VA, as many of you know, is, is, has a strongly driven formulary, um, and uh, their formulary decision was new starts could use um, alternative agents um, off the bat. Um, and uh, they, they feel like that's ultimately ch um, more effective and, and is cost efficient for them. So, um, but outside of that, Aurora and Vanderbilt, we still see a lot of use for warfarin. And I want to give a, another example of one of our adopter sites and, and um, their adoption and some of the influences of this. So Sanford um, uh, is in the Dakotas, and they have um, adopted um, uh, a lot of the CPIC prescribing um, recommendations um, and uh, have been going on for a couple of years. Um, and this, this is actually showing the number they've genotyped for clopidogrel um, coming through the cath lab. But one of the things that's really interesting, you see this inflection point here. Um, and this really results, um, uh, this inflection point occurred essentially after uh, Lori presented um, our uh, data from Ignite on um, uh, uh, the outcomes um, from, uh, uh, with uh, major adverse cardiovascular events uh, uh, following um, those who are switched to genotype-driven 
uh, driven therapies versus not, and showing that those um, events uh, essentially decreased um, alternative agents um, in a significant way. And uh, so uh, th this individual uh, director of the cath lab became a supporter, and, um, and uh, uh, their adoption has increased. We're also looking at cost effectiveness, um, and this is work by Josh Peterson. Um, he has a website that they've put up there on the bottom there. Um, it's in beta, and have done some initial simulations um, looking at the incremental cost effectiveness ratio per quality here. Um, and you can see that the cost is pretty low with some given assumptions for minor or little frequencies, um, event rates, um, the changes in odds ratio of events based on, for instance, clopidogrel versus prasugrel or ticagrelor. Um, uh, but, you know, it's probably not necessarily cost efficient to genotype just for simvastatin in this example. Now, these are, you know, this is early work. This is given a lot of assumptions. You can go online and actually simulate um, your own scenarios if you want. Um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, you can see some cases it might be a clear win, other cases it may not be. You know, this, I think, points to other experiments which um, Josh and his team are doing, looking at multiplex testing. Um, and, um, and that may be where some of the true wins um, are um, in terms of cost effectiveness. So a few of our lessons learned, um, uh, you know, implementation is about many things, um, and you've heard about a lot of them, and I just kind of boiled it down to a few, but, you know, our, our laboratory test, even something simple like that, we haven't talked a lot about, is, is still a bit of a bleeding edge, and we dealt with issues there and, and have dealt with issues transitioning that in a CLIA environment. Um, you know, we've all dealt with a lot recently, a lot of EHR upheaval and changes, and we're going through that um, ourselves now. Um, that will probably, we think, settle down um, as many places have now adopted initial EHR systems, um, but it's still a, a transition point. Um, and every implementation has been different, um, and that's both environment and EHR specific. And so we need to think about ways, I think, of, of um, going past that, as Sandy and the others have pointed out. Um, we need to think about local provider buy-in um, in many ways, and that's belief in clinical um, efficacy is very important. Ease of use and familiarity with the system are all very important factors there. Um, we found that advice changes frequently and opportunities to reuse the data over time um, is, um, is frequent. And that drives a need for surveillance and getting back to patients, and um, those are points that um, Heidi and others have brought up uh, earlier as well. I want to give you one uh, real-world example from our samples, and then I'll um, uh, stop. Um, so this is a 57-year-old uh, early on in the program who came in who had diabetes, first incidence of um, angina um, and, and any no-known heart disease, and she was cathed, uh, received a stent, clopidogrel started, that stent closed off, um, it closed off again, and she was re-stented. Um, Restented again and, and received more stents. And by um, 11 months later, by December, she had been admitted nine times, um, had f uh, five interventions with nine stents placed, and um, of course was at this time noted to be a poor metabolizer um, and uh, was switched to Prasugrel. You know, this, this highlights, um, uh, you know, this was. Uh, uh, you know, the need for these sorts of examples um, uh, and uh, uh, potential power for some of the extreme cases. Um, uh, this is clearly an outlier, um, uh, but uh, these cases do exist and is, I think, a powerful story of where there should, could be some cost benefit as well. So with that, I'll um, end, and um, there are many, many people that are part of this as well as with everyone else who has talked. So um, thank you for your time. Thanks for your unstenting efforts in this regard, Josh. Why don't you go ahead and sit down and we'll open up our um, uh, discussion period.